Good morning and welcome. Members of the Grandview University community, faculty, staff, students, alumni and friends who are joining us online, welcome to this annual World Food Prize address. And Dr. Nelson, we welcome you as well. The World Food Prize address has become a tradition here at Grandview that date back, dates back more than 15 years. Our speaker's participation today is made possible by the World Food Prize Foundation based right here in Des Moines and is in honor of Dr. Norman E. Borlaug, the Iowa native and Nobel laureate who is credited with launching the Green Revolution and saving a billion lives through his research and development of food crops, primarily in third world countries. This series was created by the foundation to share the expertise of the World Food Prize laureates and guests with colleges and universities across the state. And we have been blessed over the years as we are today to benefit from this gift from the World Food Prize. Now, normally we would gather in person in a large room for this World Food Prize address. Well, this year is anything but normal. So Dr. Nelson has graciously agreed to deliver his address to our community virtually. And I'm grateful that our faculty in the natural sciences urged us to do so instead of canceling this year's address altogether. I think there's some real significance and symbolism in that decision. You see, during this pandemic, even during lockdowns around the world, people needed to eat. People in the food industry have been identified as essential workers. We've sometimes referred to them as working on the front lines of this crisis. Even with the deadly virus spreading rampantly among populations around the world, Food needs to be produced, delivered, and sold to customers in groceries and markets. And for those in financial need, that delivery system includes food pantries and subsidized school lunch programs and so on. So you see, the decision to hold this World Food Prize event in essence says this important work needs to go on, even in a pandemic. How fitting. It's also fitting that today's speaker developed expertise in not the production of food, but the science that supports the storage and transportation of food. It's his expertise, expertise that it helped keep those trucks moving throughout this pandemic, carrying fresh and safe food from where it is produced to where it is consumed. So I now invite Dr. Carl Moses forward to introduce our speaker. Thanks. I'm very pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Philip E. Nelson, who may be familiar to some of you as he previously addressed our campus community in the fall of 2008, after being named a World Food Prize Laureate in 2007. Over his career, he has become known as the leader of modern food science and technology. At the conclusion of Dr. Nelson's presentation, we've set aside some time for him to answer questions. Please use the chat box feature at the bottom of your screen to submit those questions. Dr. Nelson grew up on a 500 acre farm near Morristown, Indiana, where he helped with his family's tomato canning factory known as the Blue River Packing Company. The operation was very subject to the seasonality and perishability of the tomato crop. When he was 15, Dr. Nelson won a 4-H award for the 24 perfect tomatoes he had entered at the Indiana State Fair. He became known as the Tomato King and subsequently became involved with Purdue University's extension system. He obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in agriculture and then returned to the farm and canning operation where he became the plant manager. The tomato industry, however, was gradually moving west to California, so the family's company was forced to close. Dr. Nelson then returned to Purdue where he became a part-time instructor in the horticulture department while studying for his PhD. He earned that degree with a dissertation on the volatility of flavors in canned tomatoes. He was then offered a tenure track position on the T Purdue faculty, a position he held for 50 years until his retirement. In the 1970s, Dr. Nelson was part of a National Academy of Sciences team that traveled to India to study the problem of food spoilage. That led him to begin exploring ways to preserve food for distribution and consumption in developing countries. His work revolutionized the food industry by establishing new methods for small and large scale aseptic packaging, storing and transportation of fresh fruits and vegetables. His achievements have benefited developing countries 
by providing an inexpensive packing and shipping system for importing and exporting foodstuffs and ensuring the safe delivery of nutritious and flavorful products that has helped minimize food loss throughout the world. Dr. Nelson has received numerous honors throughout his career, including the Institute of Food Technologist prestigious Nicholas Appert Award in 1995, the Food Processing Putnam Food Award, and the National Award for Agricultural Excellence. In the same year, Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels announced the creation of the Philip E. Nelson Innovation Prize, recognizing outstanding Hoosier scientists for their discoveries, research, and inventions. On his retirement, Purdue University rededicated its campus food science building as the Philip E. Nelson Hall of Food Science. It is my distinct honor and privilege to present to you our 2020 Food Prize Address Speaker, Dr. Philip Nelson. Well, hello, Grandview University. I wish I were there to uh, talk with you in person. However, uh, this uh, virus has caused us to do many things that we didn't think we knew how to do. Fortun fortunately, uh, uh, I'm here and I wanna thank uh, President Henning, uh, the faculty and you students for allowing me to uh, come back to Grandview and give you a, a presentation on my career, which really was unexpected and it had a world impact. I'm a professor emeritus at Purdue. I retired in 2010. So I can say officially, I'm really retired now. And so uh, my story tells uh, how it was impacted. And I'm going to point out some uh, career uh, changers that affected my career. And really, um, I didn't have much to do with it except being able to accept it at that time. So I think for the students, uh, it'll begin to show you that uh, you don't have everything planned out, but as, uh, as your career moves on, things happen that change the direction of uh, where you're going. Uh, as mentioned, I grew up on a family farm in Shelby County, Indiana. And unusually, my family owned a tomato canning plant. Right after the war, there were 200 canning plants just in Indiana. Uh, we were canning tomatoes and did there for some 30 years. But as the uh, uh, industry grew in the Midwest, um, I went to Purdue. I just met my wife at, on campus. It was her first week on campus. I was at that time, I was a junior, and a year and a half later, we were married. Uh, after my BS, I went back to the family farm knowing that I was going to be the plant manager and that my life's career was canning tomatoes. However, after four years, after the plant uh, then shut down, I wondered, what am I going to do? Uh, I went back to Purdue and it was accepted in the vet medicine uh, program. It was not easy to get in, but they did accept me. And so uh, as I went up to campus, my wife and I in June, we by chance visited a professor that I'd had one course from in, in the food processing area. Well, before I left his office, I called the vet school, said I'm not coming and I accepted an assistantship with this professor in horticulture. I received my PhD in 1967, thinking that I was going directly into industry, but things happen and all of a sudden I was assistant professor at Purdue, certainly a career changer. And of course, as an assistant professor and a major research university, I had to begin my research. I remembered back while I was on the, the farm and the canning business in Indiana, that we lost a lot of tomatoes. We just couldn't get them into the can quick enough. So the bottleneck was really the canning. And I wondered, was there some way, somehow, I could help this uh, product loss? 
Well, in the 40s, I had been reading about a process that had been developed called aseptic processing. And just a brief uh, uh, sketch of how that works. As you know, with canning, you put everything into the can and you seal it and you heat the product and everything in the container. But with aseptic processing, outside of the container, we heat the product and cool it down. We sterilize the package separately, and then we bring the two into a sterile environment. And of course, the main thing is that container now can be any size. We close it, and it doesn't require any refrigeration. Interesting technology, but really hadn't uh, developed much uh, in the 40s. Here's the key, and what really caught me was I could heat, heat the product outside of the container, and that would allow me to use any size container to package the product and hold it. So I had the idea, if we could grab those tomatoes, bring them in and process them quickly, they would have to be chopped, of course, and then we could put them into a tank uh, before you get the wrong idea that BS stands for bulk storage. And then later uh, we could take the product out there and, and make the product uh, containerize in a can or jar, make the ketchup, the sauces and products uh, as the consumer wanted. Well, how do you do this? Uh, professors, uh, assistant professors need money. And I couldn't find any support until I contacted a beer tank manu manufacturer in Ohio. It was making tanks for the beer industry. Small company. Uh, I could talk to the president and convinced him that if I could just maybe develop a technology for some products, um, it would expand their market uh, for tanks. And so they sponsored my research. It was interesting at Purdue, this was in the early or late 60s, I should say. Uh, one of the first uh, professors to take industrial money to uh, support a research project. In fact, I was told that uh, taking that money could harm my career, uh, but I was determined. And so uh, the company gave me five little pilot tanks, as you can see there in the background. Uh, some were stainless, some were refrigerated, uh, some had an epoxy type resin. And so I decided to test all of that. And of course, in the pilot lab, to fill one of those little tanks, even though it's 100 gallons, it took a long time. So I had a lot of student help and a lot of students that remember their tomato summers uh, while they were at Purdue. Uh, with all my experimentation, I found that one thing worked and this was a 100 gallon tank that had an epoxy type lining. That lining I could sterilize with a chemical solution. And so I could put products into a sterile tank. Now I had to do some developing of aseptic valves and aseptic filters at that time, uh, but I was successful. I decided to bring in the Heinz and the Hunts and the Campbell soups to look at the product and it was great after several months storage. Uh, no loss of vitamin C, good color, the industry thought it was perfect, except uh, Dr. Nelson, this is a good university project. Uh, it certainly wouldn't work in industry because a 100 gallon tank, we would need thousands of these size tanks to fill uh, because of our, our uh, demand for the product. So they said, um, good idea, but sorry, we're not interested. Well, I could have stopped there, I guess. I had some publications, I had some patents, and uh, probably enough to get promoted, uh, but I was determined, well, let's try one more thing. So I, I had a thousand gallon tank installed outside of Purdue. Uh, now this was in the 60s, and uh, I didn't ask anybody if I could put that tank up. Uh, it was installed. It had to be insulated so it wouldn't freeze in Indiana. 
and we filled it with a thousand gallons of chopped tomatoes. After 18 months, I brought Heinz and Hunt's Campbell Soups people back in. They said the product is wonderful, but again, the tank is too small. A thousand gallons just wouldn't work in industry. A good university project, but not to be put into industry. Well, the sponsor and myself talked this over and we said, maybe we could find a company that where we could scale this up. We found with a sponsor, we found a company in Pennsylvania who would put in two 15,000 gallon tanks. And those people that you see there are, are my graduate students. We would go over in the summer, uh, we could take over the plant uh, after about midnight and we could run till six in the morning. We all summer we filled these two tanks with the pizza sauce, fifteen actually thirty thousand gallons of pizza sauce. Held them, and I guess we would say we crossed our fingers. But in October, I got a call from the plant in Pennsylvania saying, "Sorry, Dr. Nelson, the product is spoiling. Is spoiling," and so. <laughs> Wow, what a blow. I, I, I couldn't believe this. Well, what happened uh, with good research, you keep good records. And so we poured back over the heating programs and all of a sudden we found one place, two in the morning on a specific uh, uh, night in August where the temperature dropped just for a second and then went back up. We were tired. We didn't think that would hurt anything. Well, we were wrong. We convinced the company to come back the second year to try it. Uh, we did, and by golly, we were, we were successful. I'll never forget when an, an Indiana food processor, the first one to uh, uh, take a roll of the dice, I guess, came into my office and said, do you think it will work? And with my fingers crossed under the table, I said, I think so. In Portland, Indiana, NOS Foods put in eight 40,000 gallon tanks. You, you can see in the front that, that little tank nestled between the tanks. That was the thousand gallon that we had at Purdue. Well, he filled this uh, with chopped tomato, held it, used product from it. It was successful. And I can say again, this was another career changer because without this entrepreneur rolling the dice and thinking it would work, well, it happened. The word got into the trade magazines and all of a sudden I had visitors from Japan. A company called Kikuman, who also uh, processed tomatoes in Japan, uh, asked if they could use this technology there. And the next thing that I knew, I'm off to Japan. This farm boy from Indiana, I spent many trips to Japan, staying there uh, several weeks at a time. Uh, they put in eight, uh, um, I mean, sorry, 12 80,000 gallon tanks, and not only for tomato, but grape juice, apple juice, and, and other products. Again, with this size and scale, this was another career changer. They were one of the people that made my career uh, successful. I didn't ask for it, but I got it and took advantage of it when it came along. Um, in 1982, I had a company called Tropicana uh, came to my office and said, we see that it's working for tomato. Do you think it would work for orange juice? Our marketing people want to develop a product where they can put on the label and say, not from concentrate. If you recall back then, most everything was in what we call the three-in-one can. It was frozen concentrate. You would take it home, thaw it, uh, add three cans of water to it, and uh, uh, that was the way you drank your orange juice then. Uh, so uh, we tested some orange juice. We found where, you, where we could do that in our 100-gallon tank. And the next thing I know, again, another career changer, Tropicana was adding tanks 1.8 million gallons each. I could not believe it. Those tanks were six stories tall, about six stories wide, 
and then and currently they're even up to uh, building tanks over two million gallons. A big change. We couldn't leave. We found we couldn't leave those tanks in the hot Florida sun. So if you go to Florida, you won't see any tanks outside. But there's over 300 tanks inside a refrigerated uh, warehouse uh, where they can keep it cool. The juice is filled into the tanks, sterile, uh, and then throughout the rest of the year, uh, they can pull the juice out and make many products. And of course, this is what you see, some pulp, no pulp, uh, vitamins, no sugar, whatever. Amazing what they can do with this. When they bring it out of the tanks, it's no longer sterile. And so with a the refrigeration, they can hold the between 60 and 90 days without any loss of or de deterioration of nutrients and, and flavor. So it is a significant impact on the industry. Look at that frontage that they get now that they didn't have before. Well, I didn't know that Brazil produced 53% of all the orange juice consumed in the world. They employed over 400,000 people. Well, it wasn't very long after Tropicana started uh, the industry uh, with tanks. Uh, I had Brazilians come to my office and they said, you know, you're putting us out of business because we've been shipping frozen concentrate. They said, do you think we can use your tanks uh, some way to help Brazil? And the next thing I knew, I was off to Norway looking at ships. This ship hauls currently today, and there are, there are more than three, eight million gallons of single strength orange juice around the world. Uh, amazing. And again, another innovator that made my career a changer. If you look into the hull of the, the ship, uh, there are half a million gallon tanks um, in the ship. It's a refrigerated ship in the sense that it's cool and it's shipped to all parts of the world where it's unloaded into tanks and then eventually into the consumer package. All from this little tank uh, that occurred in my research project at Purdue. Well, another career changer of mine was a gentleman who came to my office uh, named William Scholey. He was putting battery acid in plastic bags. And he said, you know, I really would like to be able to feed the world in the, with these plastic bags. Can you help me develop um, a filler that, and a bag that would allow me to um, move products around in a plastic bag? You know, at that time with, with aseptic processing, which was going on, uh, everything was shipped in tin line drums. Uh, they were too expensive. They couldn't be. They couldn't be afforded in the developing parts of the world, and so uh, uh, this plastic bag was was an alternative. And in fact, we did develop a plastic bag that could be sterilized, uh, a filler that would fill the bag aseptically or sterilely, and so all of a sudden we had a package now that could be filled with pumpable product. Uh, and ships uh, all around the world. Uh, certainly the bags that we see quite often used are, is this size container. Uh, of course, it's scaled up to a 55 gallon replacing the drum, but currently today it's, uh, the bag is in a 300 gallon, what we call bag and box. Uh, you may see that in the wine stores, um, but not the 300 gallon bag. This uh, almost 80, I'm sorry, 85 to 90% of all tomato paste packaged in the world that's used for later remanufacture is now put into the bag and box. So how did my work contribute globally? Well, there have been tank installations in num numerous countries. And in the USA, there's over uh, 350 tanks now being used for single strength orange juice. The tomato industry 
ironically moved to the bag and box. Fortunately, that was also developed in my lab. And of course, the bag and box uh, is used by oh over 180 countries around the world. It's inexpensive. It can be used uh, for products uh, that can be shipped to uh, customers um, far and far and beyond. But maybe the most important thing I did was to develop a workshop in 1983. Uh, it was to train people how to, to use aseptic processing and packaging. And we trained people from around the world. We also uh, took our faculty to individual company workshops where we put on training pro programs. Uh, we actually literally trained thousands of people on the use of aseptic uh, techniques. You know, as a consumer, this is what you see. So this juice box concept was some of the first to come out. Uh, you may wonder how chicken stock can sit on the shelf without refrigeration. Well, it's aseptic and that this box then will allow you to hold the product for, for um, um, a year or more. And other containers we see now uh, use aseptic processing. But probably the most important thing is we now can develop things like milk into the remote areas of the world uh, where refrigeration is not available. No refrigeration required. And now these school children are having a nutrition, nutritious milk drink uh, and other kinds of products that uh, they didn't have access uh, before. Well, you heard about the World Food Prize who was established by Norman Borlaug in 1987. You know, it's amazing that his uh, wheat varieties has, has been considered to save maybe a billion lives. Can you imagine the development of a dwarf wheat that could be used in India, Pakistan, and other parts of the world feeding hungry people? Uh, the prize recognizes individuals that have had an impact on world food hungry. And it's sort of considered the Nobel of agriculture. When I told my children that I had, uh, had been announced that I would receive this award, they all were so excited. They thought, my goodness, we're going to Stockholm, Sweden. This will be wonderful. Well, I had to tell them they were going to Des Moines, Iowa. I was contacted in the spring of 2007, and of course, that too was a career changer. In the Des Moines capital, I received the award. It's an amazing ceremony. Uh, I hope someday you've had a chance to see it. If not, it is uh, uh, not this year, of course, because of the COVID, but years in the past was covered on your PBS uh, stations there. The World Food Prize gave me a soapbox. Uh, I now had the opportunity that I never had before, a, definitely a career changer. My first of over 200 calls uh, came from my senator uh, congratulating me. And of course, uh, now I had an access uh, to go to him later on. You know, my area of research uh, focuses after production. And you know, my focus was not to produce more, but to save what is produced. Uh, you know, between 60 to 70% of the grain produced in Africa is stored at the farm level. There's no community grain storage. It's all stored on the farm. farm. And the post-harvest losses, that is before it gets to the consumer, are from between 20 to 40 percent. And for things like tomatoes and other fruits, it could be as high as 50 percent. I'm sure you've seen this figure, but today our 7.8 million people by 2050 will grow to 9 billion people. And believe it or not, we need to double the food supply a challenge that uh, we're hoping we can meet, but it's really incredible. You know, there's not only a need to produce more, 
But I would say there's also a need to save what's produced. The FAO just recently in 2020 uh, saw the food losses, losses in sub-Saharan Africa get over 4 billion annually. This is not waste. That's another issue. These are losses uh, before it gets into the market stream. And this is why, this is what you would see in, in uh, parts of Africa, how they would store their grains for selling it later or having it for the family. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's improved, at least it's off the ground, uh, but still needs some effort. And of course, thrashing looks like this uh, to get the chaff from the wheat, um, very primitive and may not be able to change some of these, we know but certainly uh, much can be done to help that. You probably have heard the old saying, give a man a fish and he'll eat today, teach a man a fish and he will live forever. I added to that, I'm saying teach a man to preserve his fish. He will now build an industry. He'll build jobs for workers. He'll be able to keep the food uh, much longer uh, safely and available for, for consumption. So in developing countries, there's a need to focus on uh, food losses. We want to be able to add value so this, these small farmers uh, in Africa can add value to their product. And of course, the big concern is food safety. Well, I got a major grant. Uh, as I said, the World Food Prize gave me a, a career changer. Uh, I was able to talk to my senator and, and to get uh, uh, money to strengthen the value added chain, the process of which, by which crops go from farm to market to fork. And we began in Senegal and Kenya. Uh, these women are taking their grain and they're pounding it to, to get the outer sh uh, core off. Uh, uh, not very good. The product that they would take to market wasn't very clean. Uh, they hardly uh, broke uh, even on their money. And so we, de we developed some innovation centers where we could bring in appropriate technology, not fancy technology, just simple technology. And they could mill their grain and they could package it and they could make different products, grits, uh, semolina and flowers. All of a sudden, uh, these women uh, were, were making money and this money was really to send their kids for a better education. Well, this work continues and is, is growing even though I'm no longer involved in it. It, it is, is growing as we speak today. Well, like Borlaug said, one person can make a difference. The thing is, you have to dream big. You've got to think you can do things that you never believed you could do. You need to have a vision and you have to be passionate. You don't plan on getting resources through the normal channels. I couldn't get money from the university or USDA. Be prepared for skeptics. You know, the industry said it just won't work. They got to be determined. If I could underline one, it would be this one. Remember, failure is not the falling down, but the staying down. You got to build a core of important believers. You got to have support out there. And of course, you got to be flexible. Never stop learning and be open to change. You know, change is, is an important issue. You know, how many people are saying, I don't want to learn these new things. I want to be like it was in the past. Be open to change. It's going to happen. And underline, prepare yourself to take advantage of what might come along. I had over seven career changers that had I not been prepared to take advantage of, I wouldn't have moved on in my ability to make a difference. Well, that's my story. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think now we have a chance to have some question answer period. Um, have a good day and uh, we'll, we'll uh, now re uh, move to question.
I'm not hearing you, Kent. Are we back on? Can you hear me? But I'm not hearing you. I don't know what the problem is. I'm not hearing you right now. Well, I don't know. How about now, Dr. Nelson? Now I hear you. Okay. All right. Um, apparently, my, my headset wasn't working properly. All uh, right. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, a, a fascinating story and some really important lessons. Um, we'll have a chance now to have some questions and answers. And I'm going to take advantage of my position to, to ask a question to start. Um, you referred to your method as uh, aseptic processing. And I'm curious to know what the difference is between that and pasteurizing. Uh, pasteurizing kills only the spoilage or oh, I'm sorry, only kills the health uh, of health concern organisms. In other words, uh, if, as you know, pasteurizing, uh, if you take milk, even though you refrigerate it, it will spoil because we don't kill all of the spoilage organisms in pasteurization. We kill those of health concern. In aseptic processing, we kill all of the organisms. And so it is a, we call it a commercially sterile it's not totally sterile because we can't kill some of the real heat resistant organisms, but they're of no concern to either spoilage or uh, uh, our health. So uh, um, that's the big difference. Spoilage is destroyed. They're a sterile product. We're able to do it so quickly with heat because we put this product into a thin film that we don't destroy the nutrients. Gotcha. Uh, I have a question here. Um, when you would meet with a prospective graduate student thinking about bringing somebody into your research group, what were you looking for? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, certainly they had to have the credentials of being interested in science. Uh, food science is a science uh, you take chemistry, you take microbiology and a little engineering. So uh, they had to have that kind of background. But I wanted a student that uh, was able to think outside of the box a little. Uh, a lot of times uh, uh, students from the farm uh, who had to work on the farm and maybe using baling wire to keep something going, uh, always figured out a way to solve a problem. And so they often were able to uh, be at the front of problem solving. You know, as you do research, you hit a, you hit a spot where it's not working and, and you don't know what to do. Uh, how do you get around it? Uh, the Japanese uh, know how to do this by forming a team uh, to get around it. But uh, unfortunately uh, uh, in the US we don't form teams. So it's important to that individual have that unique ability to sort of to sort of think out of the box. So I I was always looking for that. It's hard to hard to test for that, but certainly uh, they had to had to have that kind of uh, give me that kind of gut feel. I guess uh, that I used in in selecting students. Uh, one of the participants is curious about what part of your research did you like doing most? What was your favorite? Well, since I grew up 
you know, in a, in a canning industry, I really, really enjoyed working out in the field. Um, you know, when these uh, installations were going up, uh, I was out there uh, testing them to be sure that they were performing uh, what, what they were supposed to do. You know, I probably was in Japan six, seven times um, around the world in Brazil and Costa Rica and in Spain. Um, that was my most enjoyable time. And to think that as I grew up in Indiana, I hadn't been out of Indiana. I'd never been on a plane. And so all of a sudden I was, I was riding high on the world. It, it, was, it was fun. Great. Um, I, here's a, another question. I'm amazed whenever I see the percentages of food products that are lost to spoilage. What crops or food products are still most likely to be lost uh, to post-harvest uh, spo spoilage? Is this sort of oh yeah, the, the most, Im the most uh, Im probably the most important ones are the fruits and vegetables because they're, they're more perishable. Uh, you know, in, with my technology, I can't, I can't preserve a, a whole tomato. It's got to be a tomato that's going to be used. And of course, uh, in Nigeria, for example, one of the major food crops, believe it or not, is tomatoes. Uh, and so they, they, uh, they preserve and, well, they lose a lot of tomatoes. And so we're there now trying to uh, do some aseptic processing of tomatoes where they'll be able to keep their supply and use it in their, their diet and uh, throughout the year. Cassava is the same way. There are, there are many crops. Mango in India, we've opened up a whole world market for, for the use of mang mango pureed, purees. You know, we like a lot of smoothies and uh, uh, certainly that's used. In uh, Venezuela, Venezuela and Costa Rica, uh, the bag is being used for banana puree. And uh, as you know, much of that goes into baby food. So uh, we have opened up markets uh, in various parts of the world. And, and this food loss is going to take more than just aseptic processing. It's a major undertaking. Great. Um, now that you're retired, what goals do you have professionally and personally? Well, you know, it took me, I, as I said, I retired in 2010. I'm a professor emeritus. Uh, you know what that means? It means I have the, the rights and privileges of the full professor without money. Uh, I could have stayed on at Purdue. I would have had an office and, uh, you know, been in my own building. Uh, but I felt it was time to let uh, the younger faculty take the lead and take the role. Uh, we have professors that stay on until they almost are, are uh, well, pass away. Uh, that takes up space in the lab. I'm, I guess I'm of the feeling that uh, you've got to make room for the, for the younger ones coming along. And so uh, after five years, uh, I really retired. I didn't go, I, I now live seven miles, I'm sorry, seven hours uh, from Purdue University campus. I only get to back, back there periodically. I'm not there daily. Um, so uh, my, my professional career is, is really retired. The World Food Prize uh, has still uh, given me this opportunity I still stay active. I still do research um, in, in uh, literature. Uh, so uh, if I see something, I will send it to a colleague back at the university and, and just subtle, subtly suggest you might want to look into this. So that's, that's sort of my professional career right as it stands now. I, I appreciate that. I, I'm a scientist myself and um, I, I know that there are, I have colleagues who are productive for many, many years. And so I really admire your, your productivity. I also admire your willingness to make room for, for the younger ones. Yes. Um, are there any other questions? I, I don't see new questions showing up. Uh, if, 
we'll pause for a few seconds to see if someone wants to enter. Another I see there's five chats down at the bottom. I don't know what that is. Yeah, we've covered all of those. Okay, good. Well, that's fine. Um, I hope everyone has a good day. It's well, a beautiful day here in Northern Michigan for a change. <laughs> Uh, we'll pass it now back to President Henning for him to offer a few closing remarks. And I'll just say again how much I appreciate you being with us, Dr. Nelson. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Nelson, for that stimulating and enlightening address. I find it interesting that you grew up on a, on a farm, you, you helped your family raise tomatoes, and you built that into a very uh, successful and, and impactful career. I grew up on a farm, I helped my mother raise tomatoes, and today I plant two tomato plants so that I can have a fresh BLT uh, once or twice a year. I commend you for uh, the inspiration you received in your humble upbringings and what you made of your life and the impact that you've had in the world. We're deeply grateful to the World Food Prize for making it possible for you uh, to be with us today, Dr. Nelson. Uh, you know, we here in Iowa are one of the largest food producing states in our country, and you have reminded us that while we're aware of a lot of science that goes into producing crops, there's also a lot of science that's needed uh, after those crops leave the field. So I thank you. You have uh, fulfilled one of the purposes of this academic address. And that is to stretch our minds a bit, to challenge us to focus collectively on a topic larger than any of our individual academic pursuits. And yes, to inspire us to learn more. To all of you present, present today, I wanna to thank you for your attendance and your interest. We look forward to seeing you at future World Food Prize events here at Grandview. Have a great day.